What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Why can't women become priests? Why do Catholics worship Mary? Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? Where is purgatory in the Bible? I think the Pope has too much authority. What's stopping you? You, you, you? you are called to communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Hey everybody, welcome again to Call to Communion here on EWTN. This is the program for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters. Is that you? Are you a non-Catholic? Maybe you were a Catholic years ago, uh, fell away from the faith for whatever reason. Maybe you've never been a Catholic at all, but in either event, you may have a question or two about what the Catholic Church actually teaches. We're here to answer those questions once and for all. Here's our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- 288-3986. If you're uh, listening to us outside of the U.S. and Canada, you'll want to dial the number 1 and then 205-271-2985. And of course, you can always send us an email. The address for that, ctc at ewtn.com, ctc at ewtn.com. Michael McCall is our producer today. Uh, Matt Kabinsky, our phone screener. Jeff Burson handles social media for us. If you want to also ask a question via YouTube or Facebook, we are streaming there live today. All you have to do is put your comment, your question in the comments box. And Jeff will see that. He'll shoot it to us here in the studio. And uh, off we go. Hopefully we can get your question answered on today's program. I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Anders. Tom, how are you today? Doing great. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing decent. Thank you. We have an interesting question here from Laura right here in Alabama to lead us off today. Laura says, in my prayer group of 55 plus year old women, many of them have family members who are not Catholic or who have left the faith. The quote, rapture is a point of contention in their families. They're seeking to understand of the concept and uh, also the Catholic rebuttal to it. I offer to put together some talking points. Would you please offer your top responses to the rapture and best Catholic apologetic sources for deeper understanding? Thanks, Laura in Alabama. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I really appreciate the question. So the doctrine of the rapture is a Protestant doctrine that was invented in the 19th century uh, and has no precedent in Christian tradition. It, we, you don't find it in Catholicism. You don't find it in Eastern Orthodoxy. <clears throat> you don't even find it in classical Protestantism, and most Protestants don't hold this doctrine. Mm. It's primarily held by fundamentalists, uh, Baptists often, or those of kind of a Baptist sensibility, and was popularized in the United States in the early 20th century through something called the Schofield Reference Bible. It was invented by a man named John Nelson Darby, the doctrine was, and then picked up by Schofield in his Reference Bible, which became a kind of a standard um, interpretive framework for a lot of fundamentalists reading Mm, the sacred text. Uh, The the key issue with the doctrine of the rapture is is the notion that there are not two, but three comings of Jesus. You know, in classical Christian theology, Christ comes once in the Incarnation, he comes again at the end of time. The rapture uh, theorists postulate that Jesus will come a third time. Well, he'll come three times, and they, they, they interpose a secret coming between the first one and the last one. And this coming that is nowhere mentioned in the Bible or in sacred tradition uh, posits that, that Jesus will rapture, that is to take up out of the world, all quote-unquote true believers— and then they'll go back with Christ to heaven, and then they differ on the exact time frame, but most of them would hold for a seven-year period during which God will pour out wrath on the planet Earth, at the end of which time Christ will return to Earth with these elect that he raptured out of that tribulation and set up his messianic kingdom uh, in Jerusalem where he will reign on Earth for a thousand years. So that's the, that's the, the typical way it's, uh, it's constructed. Now, right. the, the way they come up with this is a bit convoluted, and I won't go into all the details. Um, it basically is born out of a, uh, some problems that fundamentalists have interpreting the Old Testament. Uh, most of Christian history has seen the Old Testament as either typologically or allegorically related to the New, and that you don't take the Old Testament at face value. Uh, it, it's, it, a lot of it's figurative and symbolic, <clears throat> and points us ultimately to Jesus. Hmm. Fundamentalists, because of the way they read the Bible very literalistically in a wooden way, uh, took this idea that uh, that if the Old Testament said it, it was literally true however you read it. So if the Old Testament talks about 
uh, camels laden with gold being brought into Jerusalem when the Messiah comes, well, then we got to have those camels. We got to have that gold. <laughs> and that is the kind of language that the Old Testament uses. Uh, and, uh, and so because that didn't happen in the time of Jesus, Jesus didn't come with camels laden with gold. Right. They figure, well, that must happen when he comes back the second time. We're going to get the camels and the gold when he comes back the second time. Well, that creates another problem, which is that the Christian church seems to function on, on different lines. That, that what, what motivates and animates the Christian faith is uh, a different ethic than the one exemplified by conquest and camels and gold. And so Christianity, historic Christianity, seems to be a little bit out of whack with their conception of what will happen in the end time. So some of these theologians actually conceived of the church, this is their language, not mine, as a kind of parenthesis in God's plan a kind of interlude between the Old Testament and this fulfillment of messianic expectation in the future eschaton. And, uh, and so they, they needed a way to get the church out of the way in the historical timeline. And there are, there are passages in the scriptures that talk about Christians being caught up to the Lord, mm -hmm. but they don't have anything to do with being caught up and taken away for seven years, right, at some secret coming. The classic text, of course, is 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where Paul says when Christ comes back, and he's talking about the final coming back, mm -hmm. the only coming back, uh -huh. we'll be caught up together with them, uh, with those who have died before us uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and we'll be with the Lord forever, not for seven years, but forever. And the being caught up here, the image is when a conquering uh, hero comes to liberate a city under siege, mm -hmm. uh, the people in the city would go out to meet him sure. and then lead him back in in triumph. Yeah, that's yeah. the picture that's being created. Christ comes from heaven. We get caught up with him in the air. Our bodies are transformed in the resurrection. We come back to earth you know, for the general judgment and, uh, and, and the eternal reign of Christ. So nothing to do with the, with the rapture business. Another passage from, um, from the Olivet Discourse in St. Matthew's Gospel when Jesus says it'll be like it was in the days of Noah and one will be taken and one will be left, they say, see, aha, people are taken away. But they fail to attend to the context of that text because Jesus says it'll be like in the age of Noah when the wicked were taken away and the righteous were left behind. But the rapture people think it's the other way around. Mm. They think the righteous are taken away and the wicked are left behind. Okay. Now, why would somebody believe all this stuff? I mean, what motivates them psychologically? And in my view, the reason this got popular in the early 20th century, it came on during the fundamentalist modernist controversies of, our, of 20th century Christianity. And many fundamentalist Christians were expelled from their denominations and they felt put out and kind of shoved outside the mainstream. And apocalypticism, you know, the bad guys are gonna get it and we're gonna get away, is attractive to people in that social situation. Sure, definitely. Uh, Laura, thank you so much uh, for your email. We're gonna get to the phones in a moment. There's room for your call at 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986 for Call to Communion. It's called a communion with Dr. David Anders here on EWTN. Our phone lines are open for you at 833 833- 288-EWTN, that's 833-288-3986. If you're watching us on TV today, you can participate as well. Uh, send us an email, the address for that, ctc at ewtn.com. Hey, don't miss the latest political and cultural reporting and analysis on topics of interest to Catholics and all people of faith on the world over with our friend Raymond Arroyo. And right now you can get news from the world over into your email inbox each and every week. Sign up today by going to EWTN.com, click on the word subscribe, and then uh, just look for where it says the world over. You can just put in your email uh, address and uh, we will take it from there. If you're ready now, let's go to the phones at 833-288-EWTN. We begin today with Paul, a first time caller from Utica, Michigan, listening on Sirius XM channel 130. Hey, Paul, what's on your mind today, sir? Hi, doctor. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I just saw a video on Instagram today, and it was a pro-life gentleman walking um, with a sign that read something along the lines of God loves life or God does not kill. And an uh, interviewer tried trapping him, which he did a pretty good job, and he would have trapped me as well. He said, well, didn't God kill uh, everybody but Moses and all the animals uh, other than two of each with the great flood? Just wondering how you would answer that. Yeah, I appreciate the question. Uh, I, while I appreciate this gentleman's pro-life stance, I think his his argument, his reasons for being pro-life were silly. Uh, that's I would never make that claim. 
I would never say we should be pro-life because God doesn't kill. God absolutely kills. No doubt in my mind that God kills. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about a passage like 1 Samuel um, chapter 15. Um, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did in opposing Israel. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have. Do not spare them. Kill both man and woman. Wow. I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious. New Testament too. St. Paul says uh, that when Jesus comes back, he'll punish those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord on the day that he comes to be glorified in his people. I mean, you could go on and on. I mean, there's a lot of fire and brimstone in the yeah, Bible yeah. of God uh, unleashing wrath on individuals. Isaiah 45, 7, I, the Lord, uh, create, uh, what does he say? He says, um, I create the light and the darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. I mean, so to say that, well, I'm going to take the ethical stance that I'm going to behave, um, you know, a, a, and it's sort of an exact equivalence to the way God behaves is an impossibility for us because we're not God. I mean, I just yeah. think that's kind of absurd. Uh, the argument for the pro-life cause is, uh, in particular with respect to abortion, is that fetuses are human beings. Fetuses are human beings. Embryos are human beings. Of course. And uh, an ethical principle that just about everybody on the planet recognizes is do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. And uh, you don't want someone to have killed you in the womb, unless you have some sort of psychological pathology. You don't want someone to have killed you in the womb, and therefore you shouldn't kill them in the womb. And the question, would I want to have been killed in the womb, is intelligible. I mean, that's a rational question. I understand what you're saying. I can put myself in that position. It doesn't matter if I had consciousness when I was in the womb or not. It's, it's possible for me to step into the position of the humanity of a fetus mm -hmm. and pose that query. And the answer is no, and therefore I shouldn't want somebody, if I don't want somebody to have killed me in the womb, I don't need to kill them in the womb. They're human beings. That's the argument against abortion. The same thing goes with euthanasia. Uh, these are individuals that have an inherent dignity. Mm -hmm. They're made in the likeness and image of God. Uh, our lives are not our own to mess around with. This, human beings are not a utilitarian um, uh, uh, object that I can cast away when they become useless, and nor is my own life uh, of mere utilitarian value to me yeah. um, and shouldn't be cast away in that kind of cavalier way. So that's the argument for the pro-life position, not uh, you know, not, uh, not this naive but well-intentioned statement that God never kills. Paul, is that helpful for you? That's great. I thank you very much, and I enjoy listening to you guys' show. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Paul. And that opens up a line for you right now at 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Andrews, 833-288-3986. If you're watching us on television today, you can send us an email, ctc at ewtn.com. Speaking of email, we got an email from Jared in Singapore. Dr. Andrews, you've mentioned on a few occasions that what is made present on the altar is not Christ at Calvary, Calvary. It is not time travel that connects us to the point of the crucifixion. The Christ in the Eucharist is actually Christ as he is right now. So what do we make of the Eucharistic miracles? The flesh of five of the more amazing ones is all muscle tissue from a heart that came from someone who had recently undergone torture. Yeah, thanks. So I, one should never derive one's dogmatic theology from accounts of private revelation. That's not the way we do dogmatic theology. Okay. We start with the public revelation of Christ, which is the scripture and sacred tradition, as interpreted by the magisterium, <clears throat> and that's how we formulate Catholic dogma. And so the, do the dogma on Christ and on his presence in the Eucharist is as I have described it, and, uh, and Eucharistic miracles are, by definition, um, they, are, they are outlier events that do not fit the norm, right? Okay. And, and there's a sense in which... Uh, when a Eucharistic miracle occurs, it ceases to be the Eucharist uh, because the Eucharist, by definition, is a sacrament that does not have the appearance of flesh or blood. By definition. Yeah. It, it has to look like bread and wine to be the Eucharist. If it stops looking like bread and wine, then you have something, but it, in a real sense, it stops being the Eucharist. Okay. 
There it is. Uh, Jared, delighted that you're listening to us in Singapore here on EWTN's Call to Communion. Uh, do stay in touch with us. Here's a question now from Gina. Thank you for taking my question, Dr. Anders. I am a recent convert to Catholicism after being a Protestant for 30 years in no small part due to this show. Thank you, Gina. My question today is, can I offer a sacrifice such as a fast for another person, for the resolution of another person's situation, or just to show God that my intention is important to me? Is this appropriate? I think of the many times you mentioned Job offering sacrifices for his children in case they had sinned. Thanks, Gina. You betcha. You can do it. St. Paul does this. He says, I I fill up in my own flesh what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. That's Colossians chapter 1. So you can absolutely do that. That is a very Catholic thing to do. There you go. Gina, thank you so much uh, for your email and for your kind words. We do appreciate that. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Andrews today, 833-288-3986. Interesting question here from John. My pastor brother-in-law says there are two baptisms, baptism of water and baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is he talking about, and is this biblical? Oh yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So this is a this is a cardinal doctrine in Pentecostalism. It is in fact the distinguishing doctrine of Pentecostalism that that subsequent to water baptism, that every Christian is alleged uh, to need a uh, a supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit that enables them to speak in tongues. That's the Pentecostal position, and Pentecostals refer to that. Uh, that event as the quote-unquote baptism of the Holy Spirit. And while they would concede that a Christian can go to heaven without that, they think that it is normative, that that every Christian ought to seek it, and that there's something deficient about your Christian life and discipleship if you have not attained what they call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, There are Catholics in the Catholic charismatic movement, which is not Pentecostalism, that have adopted the vocabulary. And so they will they will speak about a baptism of the Holy Spirit as this occasion when someone speaks in tongues, but it doesn't have quite the same sense in the Catholic context as it does in a Pentecostal context, because Catholic, uh, Pentecost, Catholic charismatics, of course, are bound to the catechism of the Catholic Church, and they, they've a, adopted a Protestant vocabulary and some of the activities but it has to be invested with a different doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, they don't lay the same normative stress on it. So no, no Catholic charismatic uh, who knows his catechism would say, for example, that every Catholic has to do this, that there's something fundamentally wrong about your Catholicism unless you speak in tongues. Right? They, they wouldn't make that claim. At least okay. Most of them wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, they shouldn't make that claim. Uh, but that's what they're talking about. Um, th- th- that's wrong. That's not correct. Um, the Catholic position is there is a gift of the Holy Spirit that comes subsequent to baptism. We call it the Sacrament of Confirmation. And, of course, the Sacrament of Confirmation can be accompanied by miraculous signs and wonders. Someone could be uh, confirmed in the Holy Spirit uh, through the sacrament and immediately begin, you know, speaking Mandarin Chinese, if that wasn't their native tongue. Uh, they They could prophesy. They could speak the Word of God with boldness. They could do all kinds of magnificent things. You don't have to. And that's not the necessary sign of having received the Holy Spirit. The necessary sign is, in fact, the form, the canonical form of confirmation administered by the bishop or his delegate. That, that's the, the way you know you've got it. And it's there to empower us for witness. And that might take the form of speaking in tongues or prophesying. But it's more likely to take the form of being able to live your own particular vocation in the world Uh, with a kind of charity and virtue that will draw people to Jesus. John, thanks so much uh, for your email. Appreciate hearing from you. Call to communion here on EWTN. Our phone number, 833-288-EWTN. If you have a question for Dr. David Anders, we are here for you. 833-288-3986. Let's go to Father Tony now, a first-time caller from North Dakota, listening on the great Real Presence Radio. Hey, Father Tony, thanks for calling. What's on your mind today, sir? Well, my nephew asked me the question. Uh, we have all these letters of St. Paul, including the one to Timothy. Did, do we have any record of people writing back to him? And I never learned this in the seminary. I have no idea. Did anybody ever return his letters? 
Uh, I I am not aware of of any evidence in that in that mm. regard. Um, uh, those letters certainly have not been preserved, <clears throat> and they're not part of the canonical scriptures. Okay, well that's where we have to leave it, Father. Thank you so much uh, for your call today from North Dakota. Greg is a first time caller from Boulder, Colorado, listening today on Sirius XM channel one thirty. Greg, what's on your mind today, sir? Hi, Doctor David. I love your 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 program. Thank you so much for all that you do. I'm in a conversation with a Lutheran gentleman who wants to know where in the Bible Catholic annulments are justified. Can you help me with that? Sure. 1 Corinthians 5 to 7. Uh, Paul has lengthy discussions about people's domestic relationships and the kind of relationships that are valid uh, and the kind of relationships that are invalid. And there are uh, a couple circumstances under which Paul says, well, he's one circumstance under which he says that a person is obligated to repudiate their their cohabiting partner mm -hmm. um, if they're not if the relationship isn't valid, and there's one in which he says that it is law it's lawful to repudiate but not necessary, um, and so he doesn't use the word annulment, but the idea that the, the you know the, the the apostle is forming a judgment about the legality of a particular union and what that demands morally in the circumstance and that there's there is in fact marriage law in the church that has to be followed yeah it's all there in first corinthians five to seven all right and uh, greg thanks so much for checking in from boulder today here on ewtn's call to communion forrester is watching us on youtube today forrester says how do protestants get around verses like hebrews 10 verses 23, uh, 26 and 27, that seem so clear about the possibility of losing salvation. Let's read Hebrews 10. Shall we do that? Yep. Let's go to Hebrews 10. Hang on, I'm just pulling up Hebrews 10 really quick. Um, and maybe I don't want to take too long. Hebrews 10, uh, we say 26? 26, 27. 26 to 27. Okay, Hebrews 10, 26. Uh, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Yeah, that's pretty stark, isn't it? Yeah. And that we could pick other other passages as well. Second Timothy, uh, excuse me, Second Peter, chapter two speaks of those uh, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have entered into the way of righteousness and yet turned back from it. And Peter says it'd be better for them not to have become Catholic at all than to do that. Mm. So apostasy is presented in Scripture as a real possibility. Now, the the way different Protestants handle this differently. Uh, the way it's handled in classical Reformed theology, which is the origin of the, you know, the doctrine of perseverance, the idea that if you're really saved, you're never going to lose your salvation. The way that tradition would handle texts like that is they distinguish between nominal believers and real believers. And so they would say that within the same church, you could have, you have two baptized people, uh, two professing Christians who participate in the sacraments, mm -hmm. but one of them has truly been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and one hasn't. And uh, within Calvinism which really kind of set the standard for evangelical theology in the United States. Mm -hmm. Within Calvinism, um, classical Calvinism held that baptism really can be the occasion of your regeneration and rebirth in the Holy Spirit, but that it doesn't work ex opere operato. It doesn't always work. So there are people who can be baptized and just get a wet scalp. That's the Calvinist position. Others okay. can get baptized and they really will meet God. And it hangs on your election that, you know, God predestines certain people to salvation. Mm. So you've heard about Puritanism. You know about the Puritans in New England, the Pilgrim Fathers. Uh, they all held to this. And so a lot of what animated Puritanism, the way Puritanism got a bad rap, it went down in history as kind of a nasty thing, was because for them, the way to determine the question of your election, am I really one of the ones in whom baptism worked? Well, for some of them, it was a real strict moralism, which is interesting because that seems to cut against the grain of most modern Protestantism. Yeah. Others took a different position, took a more liber uh, little more libertarian, uh, antinomian point of view. Anne Hutchinson, who's immortalized in Boston Commons, was an, was an antinomian. But for many of them, it was, well, you know you're elect if you really, you know, you live this strict regulated life. And that's how Puritans got their, got their bad ideas, but uh, got their bad reputation. But anyway, the idea was, yeah, we, we recognize that the apostates never were really believers to begin with. That's how Protestants typically handle that. Forrester, thanks so much uh, for your uh, question via uh, YouTube this afternoon. Thanks so much. In a moment, we're going to get to uh, Tanya in Las Cruces, New Mexico. A couple lines open for you as well at 833-288-EWTN, 833-288-3986 for Call to Communion.
So what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Let's talk about that here on EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Andrews. Couple lines open for you at 833-288-EWTN. We really would like to know what is stopping you from becoming a Catholic? 833-288-3986. Hey, congratulations going out to two more members of the EWTN radio family. Armor of God Catholic Radio. They are in Kempner, Texas, celebrating their fifth year with us. How about that? Also, Red Sea Radio, marking 13 years with us. They have four stations serving Texas. Congratulations to our friends at Armor of God and Red Sea Radio from all of us here at EWTN. Back to the phones now at 833-288-EWTN. Here is Tanya in Las Cruces, New Mexico, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Hello, Tanya. What's on your mind today? Hi. Thank you for taking my call, and I'll hang up as soon as I ask a question. Um, Dr. Anders was just talking about baptism, and then confirmation is that kind of like baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that you may or may not get charism. Well, if you get baptized as an infant, why isn't that considered baptized with the Holy Spirit as well? Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So the, here's the important distinction. Um, all of the sacraments are animated by the Holy Spirit. The, you're, not, you're not missing the Holy Spirit in any sacrament. So let's think about when you go to a confession, for example, the, the prayer of absolution. What does the priest say? He says, God, the Father of mercy, sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. That, of course, from John chapter 20, where Christ says to the apostles, receive the Holy Spirit, whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. So you would ask yourself, well, didn't the apostles already have the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, of course they did. Uh, All of the sacraments are animated by the Holy Spirit, and all of the sacraments give grace, but not in the same mode. And that's the key distinction, that the sacraments give grace according to different modes. So, for example, if you are a priest and you get ordained to the sacred priesthood, you received sanctifying grace that gives you the ability to offer the sacraments worthily. I'm not a priest. I don't need that grace. I don't offer the sacraments. If you marry, you receive the Holy Spirit and you receive uh, the gift of grace in a way that enables you to live the marriage state worthily. A celibate priest doesn't need that grace. He's not married. He doesn't have to worry about living the married state worthily. So the sacraments give grace, but each in a different mode. Baptism is the sacrament that washes away original sin, introduces us to the life of God, adopts us as God's children, makes us members of Christ's body, the church, and makes us baptismal priests in that Catholic church. So when Paul says that we die with Christ through baptism and are raised again with him to new life, that can only happen through the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and the fruits of the Spirit can flow out of us at that point. Um, But when you look at the uh, Sacrament of Confirmation in Scripture, particularly in the book of Acts, it's fairly evident that that this gift of the Spirit is in fulfillment of the prophecy given to the prophet Joel about in the last days your sons and daughters will dream dreams and have visions and prophesy and so forth. And, Uh And that's the way it's interpreted in Acts. This is an empowerment for witness. This is how the apostles are able to get up and speak the Word of God with boldness. So there's a different mode of the reception of the Holy Spirit, not this conformity to Christ uh, by which uh, you are living as his child, but this empowerment for for witness and ministry. Tanya, we hope that's helpful for you. Thanks so much uh, for your call today. And let's go now to uh, an email from Colton. Dr. Anders, I've been learning out the four seasons, uh, learning about the four senses of Scripture and their applications. One principle in the Catechism and St. Thomas Aquinas is that the spiritual interpretation should always be based on the literal. Can you explain how this works in practice, specifically with Paul's allegorical interpretation of Hagar and Sarah in Galatians 4, uh, verses 21 through 31? Thanks, Colton. Yeah, sure. So, you know, this is a, a principle easy to state, hard to apply, but I can give you some extreme cases. Um <clears throat> You know, it's kind of like the Supreme Court justice who said he knew it when he saw it, yep, you know? Yep, um, The uh, There is an ancient Christian writer, 4th century Egyptian. He's Syrian, actually, but he, he, was, he sojourned in Egypt with the monks, named Evagrius Ponticus. And uh, he's one of the most famous monastic theologians of the early centuries. And I remember reading in Evagrius one time, <clears throat> he was giving advice 
to monks about the spiritual interpretation and the allegorical interpretation of Scripture. And he said, do not invent an allegory for every plank on Jonah's boat. You know, don't let, <laughs> don't let, you know, don't press that allegory thing so hard yeah. that you're inventing stuff, you know, based on the tiniest little details of the, of the imagery, right? Um, that's, that's obviously, we're no longer engaged in scripture interpretation at this point. We're now just engaged in, in fanciful creation, right? And so when we talk about the literal sense, first of all, we don't mean the literalistic sense. We don't mean the fundamentalist sense of the Bible. We don't mean reading the text as the untutored man on the street would understand it. Um, we, we mean, what was the sacred author trying to convey? And that's a more subtle question. Yes. And honestly, it's harder to determine, I think. I think getting the literal sense right is very difficult. Now, your fundamentalist, he says, hey, literal sense, it, you know, what you see is what you get. Not so. Not so. Let me give you an illustration of that. What's, what's really intended in the Genesis narratives? Well, there's a lot of modern critical scholarship that would say, you know, Genesis is at least in part an apology for the Davidic monarchy. The themes of David's kingdom, of Judah, of the, of the rehabilitation of adulterous murderers, I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of themes that are considered, we find them in the book of Genesis, which, which suggests that at least some part of Genesis or some editorial process probably emerged in and around the Davidic monarchy, an apologist for, for David's royal supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in the story of uh, Judah and Tamar, for example, what's the sacred author's actual literal historical purpose Maybe it was to vindicate King David. All right. Now, um, you see what I'm saying? There's subtleties and nuances yeah, here in terms yeah. of discerning the literal. So St. Augustine, when he reads the book of Genesis, he doesn't take chapters 1 to 3 at face value as if the literal sense of the text is about necessarily just the, the you know, the temple creation of heaven and earth, uh, you know, some, you know, a few thousand years ago, the way a fundamentalist would read it. And in his allegory, you find this in the Confessions, book 13, I think, he says, well, this is an allegory for the creation of the church, which in my mind kind of lines up with the critical view of Genesis, that like connecting, uh, as Augustine connects the Old Testament to the creation of the church, well, the church is, the Israel is a type of the church and the Davidic monarchy a type of the Messiah. And so there's, there's wheels and wheels and nuances within nuances in relating this literal to to allegorical business, which is why uh, Pope Benedict says in the in his uh, post synodal exhortation on the Word of God, Verbum Domini, mm -hmm. that it's not for uh, the faint of heart, and it's not for the untutored. That there's a certain kind of expertise in handling the biblical texts that's really necessary for proper interpretation, um, and uh, and the safest course of action is you stick with the church. So I would say you're you're, you're safely within the literal. As long as you're not contravening any Catholic dogma, uh -huh. and uh, and honestly, you know, read what the fathers had to say. Their allegories are safe, right? You can stick with the fathers. Read Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict is a magnificent interpreter of the Bible. Uh, honestly, someone who does allegorical interpretation and anagogical interpretation quite well is Pope John Paul II. Most people don't realize this, but as soon as I point it out, you'll go, aha, if you've ever read The Theology of the Body— his famous lectures on human sexuality and yes, personhood, yes. they're about as allegorical as you can possibly get mm -hmm. in anagogical. I mean, clearly he's taking a literal narrative and he's turning it into a discussion of human identity and personhood and sexuality in ways that, that are connected to, but obviously far beyond the literal sense of that text, but grounded in it. Yeah. So John Paul's reflections on the Genesis narratives would be a great example of the spiritual interpretation of the Bible. Colton, thanks again for your email. Appreciate hearing from you today. Call to communion here on EWTN. Let's go now to Michael in Vancouver, listening on the great Modern Day Radio, one of our very first affiliates back in the day. Hey there, Michael. What's on your mind today, sir? Um, yeah, appreciate you both uh, being there for us and taking my call. I've, I've listened to the show off and on. Um, Mine briefly is um, I'm 66 years old, uh, was baptized 
communion, confirmation, and born and raised Catholic in San Francisco, California. Um, fifth generation uh, Catholics, but also I had a pre uh, uncle who was a priest, who was a Jesuit priest, and just growing up in the uh, in the Catholic community, I always felt uh, you know a deep sense of trust and loyalty and love for God. And uh, through my marriage, I married uh, my wife. I love her. Uh, she's Christian. She's Methodist, and um, I fell away from the church. But I came back, and my my question is: I've I've attended uh, Christian churches, uh, Protestant based, whatever, and I noticed just the pattern of how all the sermons that they have. Uh, a lot of people are saying they're unpacking the Bible, and they're they're doing this and that. And while some of the their not sermons, but some of the services are helpful, it seems to me compared to my experience as as a Catholic going to church and, you know, what I've learned from other priests and types of things like that is the correlation of, of the Catholic Church's view on the Bible study and some of the um, how, how to keep objective and keep it pure versus the subjectiveness of, of some of the different uh, masses and things I've gone to from Bible studies where a lot of people, uh, like you just mentioned, a lot of people do believe once your ticket's punched, you can't be saved. And then, you know, how that fits, because it seems there's a lot of liberties I see uh, that may lead to uh, misunderstanding or not having, like you said, uh, people who are very tutored well uh, through centuries of the Bible have studied uh, more than a person could in their life ever share that, so, or mentored. So, so how do uh, you see yeah, the yeah, I can speak to that. that I can speak to that. I really appreciate it. So here's here's the fundamental difference between the way Protestants handle the Bible and the way Catholics handle the Bible. There, there are several points, but here's a big one, the biggest one of all. For a Protestant, the Bible is the rule of faith for the Church, meaning uh, it's where the buck stops. If you want to know something about Christian doctrine or practice, you go to the Bible. And so you can't have some interpretive principle, although they do have them, they just don't admit they have them, uh, drawn from outside of Scripture, from sacred tradition or experience, that really conditions the Bible, because obviously people have diverse traditions and diverse experiences, and they'll come up with diverse interpretations. So even though they do that, the theory is that the Bible, this is the Protestant theory, the Bible is by nature perspicuous, that it's clear, that its basic teaching is apparent to the reader of goodwill who has the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, otherwise, it really wouldn't be able to function as a rule of faith. Right? You can't have it as the where the buck stops if uh, if some other authoritative principle has to come in and control the text, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, in practice, it's completely dysfunctional. Like, n it, the text doesn't work that way. God didn't intend it as a rule of faith. You can pick up the Bible and you can read it yourself, and you can tell right off the bat that, say, the book of Jude, take one example at random, is obviously not intended as a manual on church order. The um, you know, book of Isaiah is not a theology textbook. Um, you know, the, the Psalms, sure as heck, are not to be conceived as a manual of, like, you know, sacramental practice, right? And these are occasional texts written for diverse purposes, and they need to be read according to their genre. And you stick it, sticking them all together doesn't suddenly create a new genre called rule of faith. It's like, it's like if I wanted to know how to fix my car, and instead of handing me the user's manual on my Toyota Camry... Uh, you handed me, uh, you know, the the uh, Julia Child's cookbook. <laughs> it's just a category mistake, yeah, right? Yeah. Now, but but because of the problem, um, Protestants have to make out like the Bible's pers perspicuous. <clears throat> and uh, in my opinion, there's a kind of a bait and switch going on here, in a couple ways. There is, um, you know, Aristotle talks about rhetoric, how you are persuasive when you get up and talk in front of people, and two of the ways that you are persuasive is. Uh, one of them is what he calls um, uh, is uh, ethos. When a speaker comes across as being authoritative and knowing what they talk about, mm -hmm. whether or not they know what they talk about, uh, people are likely to listen. Yeah. And so commonly in Protestant preaching, you will hear a Protestant preacher say something like the following. Well, you know, the Greek says. The Greek doesn't say anything of the sort. <laughs> <laughs> right. But there'll be an appeal to esoteric knowledge. Hmm. And so you see what they're doing. They're sneaking in something like tradition or magisterial authority through the back door, mm -hmm. right? But it's no longer, it's not the magisterium of the Catholic Church. It's the magisterium of the Protestant ac Academy, right? They'll sneak that in the back door. Yeah. Well, the Greek says, 
right? Um, uh, Aristotle also talks about pathos, which is the appeal to emotion. Oh boy, do they use that one. Oh boy, do they use that one a lot. Some Protestant preachers will give an interpretation of Scripture that is just so, just out in left field, uh, but it'll be accompanying some really moving narrative of personal conversion or transformation or healing. And, and the force of this, the narrative, the force of the testimony, will seem to justify the reading of the Bible. I'll give you an example of that within Pentecostalism. Uh, the passage in the Gospel of Matthew that says, quoting Isaiah, says that he carried our infirmities. In Pentecostalism, that text is read to mean that Christ will heal you of your ailments, physical ailments like cancer and heart disease. Mm. And, um, and, uh, and that seems to be warranted when showmen stand up and lay hands on people and claim to heal them. And I personally believe that 99% of those alleged healings are fakes, but they carry it off in a way that's persuasive to the crowd, to the audience, and that would mm. seem to warrant that reading of the Bible. It'd appeal to experience, appeal to emotion, um, and, uh, and that, that, that's kind of the way it functions. All right. In Catholic Church, now, the other one is the um, Aristotle talks about uh, logos, which is, the, which is the stream of argument, can be itself compelling on its face. Reformed pastors, Calvinist pastors, are really good at this. They've studied their own doctrine really hard and fast, and they are really good at constructing an intellectual system. And the intellectual system seems so compelling, so comprehensive, so learned, that the audience, the congregation, is likely to be carried along. But at the end of the day, what you still have are all these desperate ways of trying to be persuasive or come to certainty on the meaning of the Bible, and they, they come to no agreement. They, 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 they dissolve into the you know hundreds of thousands of Protestant denominations that we have, every one of them claiming to be the guy that gets the Bible right. Mm, yeah. But the, under, the, the key problem, of course, is the theory that, A, the Bible is the rule of faith, which it's not, and two, the claim that the Bible is perspicuous. No, it's not. The Bible's meaning is not obvious. Uh, and in fact, the work of interpreting, uh, interpreting, of interpreting <laughs> Scripture is difficult. Yeah. It's quite difficult. And, uh, and you can do a lot of harm. You can pick up the Bible and think that you know what you're talking about and go out and really hurt somebody, including yourself. Hmm. Right? So what does the Catholic Church say? Well, it says what Scripture says about itself. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that the Bible is useful. It's useful. It's inspired, and it's useful for teaching and training and rebuke and growing in righteousness. It's useful. It's pedagogically useful. It's spiritually useful. Exhortation, hortatory, prayer, reflection. Um, yeah, there is theological analysis that goes in the Bible, but not in the way of a textbook, right? It is the basis for the church's uh, reflection, for her prayer life. Uh, we take prayers from the Bible and use them to help direct our minds toward God and, and toward the mystery of Christ. But these are practical ways of using the Bible that don't imply that it's somehow or another the be-all and end-all of the Christian faith. And the Bible is a, is a diverse book. It contains different genres, and it covers thousands of years. And uh, the way in which the Old Testament points to the New is obscure. The New Testament says that it is obscure. Paul says that the truth about the Messiah was hidden mm. in past ages and only revealed to God's holy apostles and prophets. It's not apparent on its face. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says only the one who has the Spirit of God is really able to discern this inner meaning, and that Spirit is connected to the unity of the body of Christ, which we have in the Catholic Church. And so the proper interpretation and use of the Bible in or out of the Mass is tied to sacred tradition, the authority of the magisterium, the writings of the fathers, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not of my own individual subjectivity, but of the church Catholic throughout the ages. Michael, thanks so much for your call. Appreciate your checking in with us from, uh, from Vancouver. It's called a communion here on EWTN. I want to tell you about one of the great weekend shows we have for you on EWTN radio. It's Conversations with Consequences. It's the weekly radio show of the Catholic Association. Your host, Dr. Gracie Christie, and her team feature conversations about the topics that matter to an educated and well-formed Catholic audience. It's a must-listen to on a Saturday morning, I'll tell you that. Check it out 7 a.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Eastern right here and uh, only here on EWTN. Let's go now to uh, Mary Ann in Salina, Kansas, listening to us today on Divine Mercy Radio. Mary Ann, what's on your mind today? Well, I was just curious. In one of the readings this morning, uh, King Herod killed James, 
And I was just thinking, is that the same king that was after uh, trying to kill Jesus after he was born? No, no, thank you. I appreciate the question. There were piles of Herods running around in the ancient world. <laughs> and uh, you have Herod the Great, who's the one that, that, that uh, built the temple and Herod's temple and so forth. Uh-huh. Uh, he's the one that, that would have killed the holy innocents. Uh, and then you have Herod Antipas. He's the one that killed uh, St. James and the one um, that uh, 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 was reigning in Jerusalem at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Um, so, yes, yeah, Scripture is confusing like that. You don't, you don't find last names unless you get, you know, somebody the son of someone. Um, we have all kinds of Marys. We have all kinds of Jameses. We got a bunch of Herods floating around. You know, there's even more than one Jesus. That's true. Mm-hmm. Appreciate that. Mary Ann, thanks so much uh, for your call today. Anne is watching us on Facebook. Anne says, my mom believes that abortion is a matter of conscience. She wouldn't do it, but others can. How can I speak with her about this issue? Yeah, that's an absurd use of the doctrine of conscience. All right, let's just push that usage to its logical conclusion. I think child torture is wrong, but I would never impose that view on someone else. I think genocide is terrible, but I'd never impose that view on someone else. I think chattel slavery is just absolutely wrong and horrific. But I would never impose that on somebody else. You want to go down the list? I think rape and torture are terrible, but I wouldn't impose that view on somebody else. This, this, is, this is not a moral philosophy. This no. is a recipe for moral anarchy, and yeah. no one actually believes that. No one believes that. Um, they only invoke that sense of conscience um, over uh, like highly disputed cultural issues. When there's a, when there's a kind of basic unanimity, you know, except sort of outlier positions, People are, are would not, you know, nobody really is in favor of child torture, right? They're not going to take that position. So right. this is a this is a dodge that uh, gets you out of difficult social situations. Mm. It's not really a sincere moral belief. It is. It might be sincere, but it's not well thought out if it is, because you can't apply that principle consistently. Here's how you appeal to conscience. And this is how the Catholic Church does it. OK. Conscience is absolutely obligatory, but it can be wrong. Conscience is obligatory, but it can be wrong. So I might, for example, let's say I live in, um, in early modern Italy. I might be persuaded in conscience that I have a moral duty to carry out a vendetta. That was a common belief at the time in the Italian city-states. It's what happened to St. Rita's husband, mm. right? Um, I'd be wrong about that, all right? But my, my culture taught me this. I, I don't, you know, I, maybe I wasn't, I didn't have anybody to gainsay that belief, and so my my own moral culpability may be mitigated. I may not be fully responsible for my actions because I don't really have a good alternative. It doesn't make the act itself objectively good. So, you know, let's take a a young girl who's raised in a materialistic, anti-Catholic, anti-Christian home. Um, You know, um, all of the women in her life are, are members of, you know, feminist pro-abortion societies. Maybe they all work for Planned Parenthood. She's been brought up from her earliest days to think that pro-life people are idiots, uh, that embryos are just, you know, bundles of tissue that are essentially part of the woman's body, um, and that uh, abortion is the greatest dignity that a woman can possibly have and the greatest expression of her autonomy, which is, of course, the highest good. And uh, and she's never been exposed to any contrary position, or if she has, it's just been ridiculed. And, uh, and then, of course, she finds herself pregnant and almost sees this as a rite of passage that now she gets to join the ranks of the truly enlightened, you know, autonomous feminists and she can, mm. can she can abort her child. And that's just a wonderful thing. That's objectively very wrong. That's objectively very wrong. Her conscience has not yet realized the objective gravity of the act. And so that figures into her moral culpability. She may not be completely responsible for the gravity of her sin, uh-huh. but it doesn't make the act itself morally good. Okay. Thank you, uh, Anne, for watching us today on Facebook, and thank you for your excellent question. We hope that's helpful for you and your mom as well. A quick one here from Noel in Quezon City in the Philippines. Dr. Anders, I often hear of offer your sufferings and physical pains to the Lord. How does that work, and where is it in the Bible? Yeah, thanks. So um, the model for this is the example of Christ himself, who says to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, Please take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. Uh, St. Paul also asked the Lord to take away from him the thorn in the flesh. And the Lord says to him, my, my grace is sufficient for you. Um, and the willingness to accept divine providence mm-hmm. and to say, okay, this is my lot. This is 
to quote C.S. Lewis, this is the adventure that Aslan has sent me. <laughs> you know, I'll take the adventure that Aslan has sent me. Yeah. I will I will take the lot that the Lord has given to me, and I'm not going to shake my fist in anger at God. Um, that resignation to the divine will is meritorious and can be and can be intended as a kind of prayer. And St. Paul echoes this in First uh, in Colossians chapter one when he says, "I fill up in my own flesh, what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of His body, the Church." These sufferings, willingly accepted from the hand of God, can be meritorious when we willingly resign ourselves to them. All and, right. uh, and for the merits of pride, to the benefit of the universal Church. Noel, thanks uh, for your question from the Philippines. Delighted that you're listening to us. Dr. David Andrews, thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. We do this program Monday through Friday on EWTN Radio at 2 p.m. Eastern with an encore at 11 p.m. Eastern. On behalf of our fantastic crew, I'm Tom Price along with Dr. David Andrews. We will see you next time here on Call to Communion. Have a great day. God bless.